organizing all this. Out of the way. So we, we were discussing with Michael uh, how to do this and what would be the best uh, the best way to uh, uh, get people more interested. And uh, we thought that perhaps doing one presentation and then case discussions would be the best way. So in terms of the presentations, I, 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 I really want to do something that I feel at this point that is uh, very hot and very important and that people are worried about and not many people know too much about it. So I thought that it was a good opportunity to do that. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about, uh, about methadone. And uh, so, uh, so we can uh, open the presentation that is somewhere in there. This presentation, Miranda, APS meeting. So this is something that I presented at the, at the APS, actually. And uh, it, is, it is interesting because <clears throat> I got first interested in methadone in the year 2002, when a paper by Ibai Frank came about on 14 cases in the ICU, where they observed actually that people were dying, and they were very worried about it, and they found that the common denominator to it was the presence of methadone. So even though that was a group study, if you look at the, at the uh, uh, labs of the patients, some had uh, hyperkalemia, some patients had calcium and magnesium that were, that were off. <laughs> They were taking medications that could cause prolongation of the TTC. So that actually then uh, uh, made it, uh, uh, the, the validity of the study was questionable. But still, what, what it really did, uh, he's, he became very vocal, very verbal. He went to many meetings, started getting people looking into that. So I think that this is what, what he has, uh, the big contribution that he has made. So I think that I always I like to, to talk about methadone a little bit because we, we, we miss the, the, the historical perspective on it. And then uh, it helps us also to tell patients that methadone is an analgesic and that the reason why methadone has uh, the, the stigma that it carries is because at certain point we changed the way that we were using it. But the reality is that it was developed by the Germans as a result of the war when uh, England started selling their morphine. So what did they do? They just came up with a new molecule. It was a very good analgesic. It, it became very popular at that time. And then after the war, it came to the state. Uh, Libby bought it for, for back control. And then it started to be used as an analgesic. And then in the 60s, with the work by Dole and co-workers, Mary Jane Crick, and all these people, that they started to realize that there was a possibility that the patient had low endogenous opioids. But you guys uh, hear me? Oh, you are recording. I see. OK. So I have to stay here. I'd like to walk around, but I won't be able to do it. And uh, so uh, just I, I will recap a little bit then. And so what I was saying is that methadone is a very interesting and very good analgesic. And the reason for that is uh, because it has half, uh, a half long uh, half-life. And it's about you know, 15 hours to 150 hours, depends on who you read. And that makes it very palatable because it's, the, the half-life is independent of the delivery system. And the way it was introduced was by uh, the uh, Germans uh, that they uh, ran out of morphine. At that point, they couldn't get it from, from England any longer, and they synthesized the new product. And then in the States, it, it, it was in the, in the 60s, it was introduced for uh, maintenance, actually, and replacement therapy on those patients that it was believed to have lower endogenous um, uh, opioids, and it became very popular, and then people just didn't like to use it as an analgesic any, lo any longer for that reason, because of the stigma that carried back then. But then about 15 years ago, it became popular again, and there were several reasons for it. One of the reasons is that it's a good analgesic drug. The other one is that, as I said before, it has a, a long half-life. And uh, the last one is, uh, is because it's cheap. And so it, from being a drug that was uh, rarely used, it started to become more popular. And for example, from the patients that I had at the beginning, I would say uh, 15 years ago, I had maybe 10% of my patients on methadone. At some point then, 10 years later, I think that I had about 50% or 60% of my patients on methadone for one reason or another. So this is, is more or less perhaps represents of what, what was the trend back in those days. And then uh, the other thing that, that is, uh, there are several things that are important about methadone. As I said before, some of the things are positive, but some of the things are a little bit worrisome. And uh, what I'm showing you here, what I'm mentioning here, is uh, the fact of the 
hepatic metabolism that is a substrate of the cytochrome P450, the ISO, ISO enzyme 2B6, 3A4, and 2D6. So that makes, makes it uh, a less reliable drug when you are doing polypharmacy, which is something that we usually do for the type of patients that we treat because they have neuropathic pain, because they have AIDS, because they have uh, uh, cancer-induced neuropathy or whatever the reason it might be. So we tend to do polypharmacy. So it, it became clear that we have to be more, more, more knowledgeable or of how to use this uh, medication. The other thing on the positive side is uh, the fact that uh, it blocks the NMDA receptors. And this has been shown in the animal model very well. When you look at the literature in humans, in clinical trials, it's not that good. But there is something there. The affinity is low. And uh, so one of the things that you can take advantage of that is perhaps to block the development of tolerance to the drug. So you don't have to escalate the opioids. So methadone there can help you by blocking the NMDA receptors. Those patients that have hyperalgesia, it also can be beneficial as well. The question that, that, that uh, Maurice uh, raised that I was talking about before is cardiotoxicity. And this is what we are worried about. And is the, re the, the, the possibility of, of co prolongation of the QT interval. Unlike morphine, there are no hepatic met metabolites with uh, methadone, something that we need to know. No adjustment is needed in patients with renal failure. It's another thing that is good, like fentanyl are two drugs that became popular for this patient population. And methadone is available also in, in parenteral formulation, so we can use it in these patients that are being admitted. So uh, the other thing that is interesting is the conversion, and this is something that was worked by Mercadante and others uh, uh, Manfredi, Paolo also work on this, Richard Payne, a bunch of other people work on this. And uh, what is interesting is the conversion when you go from one opioid uh, to, uh, to methadone. And that's something that uh, you have to uh, be aware of. So the conversion is, uh, is, 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 is something that we became more aware and more worried. Years ago, I would do a conversion. I had a patient on 300, uh, on 300 milligrams of, of morphine I would just convert in 300 milligrams of methanol or something like that, maybe maybe 200 milligrams, and then adjust the dose. I would never do that in my, in my wildest dreams any longer, just because we learn more about it. So what we are advocating now is when we introduce methadone, assume that the patient is methadone naive, rather than opioid naive, methadone naive. If the patient, for example, there are cases reported, patient was on methadone, maintenance program perhaps, and the patient goes, uh, is, is arrested and goes into jail, and then spends, let's say, three months in jail. By the time they come out, the patient is not taking methadone, haven't been taking the methadone any longer. So if you start that, that patient at the dose that was at the time that was arrested, you are putting that patient at risk. So the idea is that we are considering these patients to be methadone naive, and you start the titration slow. So if you look at the insert, for example, now with methadone, it's 10 milligrams three times a day. That's what the FDA approved, that the recommendations by the AMP, APM, AM, AAMP, and the recommendations that are going to come out soon by the APS is 2.5 milligrams three times a day. So <clears throat> that has an implication on the conversion also. So if you are going to convert the patient from 300 milligrams of morphine into methadone, then the idea is that you start methadone slowly, give the patient the opportunity to adjust. Then once you start seeing that the methadone starts having an effect, an analgesic effect, you start cutting down the morphine. And then you go up with the methadone, and then you go down again with the morphine. So you do, you do it stepwise rather than do on or non, as we were doing before. That, that has changed. And I think that is an important concept. And what we have in this slide, actually, is uh, it is also interesting, which is the, the uh, for some reason, that is not very clearly understood. These are the ratios that people are preferring to use. So if the patient is a low dose of, uh, of uh, if you are going to go to a low, low dose of, more of methadone, then you can start at 4 to 1. If you're going to end up on a high dose, then you have to do a 9 to 1 ratio, so 10% of the total dose only. 70% or, 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 or only 30% or only 10% depending on the dose of that, that you're going to be using. So we, we got to be careful with that stuff because patient can, can be hurt. Okay. So uh, delayed 
response. And uh, then if you look, for example, an another reason why we're becoming more aware and more, more worried is the fact that the FDA has actually come up with this, uh, with this advisory in November 2006, where they are uh, warning people about the uh, complexity of prescribing methadone. And then uh, is, uh, as, uh, the, the reason for this actually is that uh, some things have been seen. And uh, the, what we have seen actually has been reported, this is really not good, is uh, the, uh, the, we are looking here at, at the deaths by, by opioids, right? So if you look, for example, here at uh, the year 1999 and you compare, compare to the year 2002, you see an increase of about 130. And then if you compare with deaths related to cocaine, it's only an increase of 16% and heroin only 30% as compared to the opioids. So obviously something is going on. The question is what's going on and do we know what's going on? So the answer to that is not that simple. And what I'm showing you here is another, another way of uh, looking at the similar uh, type of data just uh, that I've been from, from 1999 to 2005. But again, look at the increase of deaths related to methadone. So the question was, if uh, within the opioids, death, which is the opioid that is causing more deaths. So some people think that is methadone. The thing that you have to uh, take into consideration when you look at the, this data, however, is these are prospective, uh, they are not prospective studies. People just go into charts, into more data, in, and, and, and they collect them. So we, it's, it's just hard to know. Like for example, how many of these patients were on benzos? So is, was the benzo or the methadone? How many were on cocaine? How many were doing heroin? how many have other diseases, all that we don't know. So it's, it's, it's unclear what's going on, but it is enough to get people worried. So I'm gonna skip some, so, and, and, and then so people got very worried and they say, uh, uh, look at the, at the, at the methadone uh, deaths that we were uh, uh, talking about before, and then look at the prescription. So again, this is not done in parallel. These are data that come from different sources. When you look at them in this way, you say, oh my God, there is an increase in prescriptions and there is an in increase in death. So it seems to be a cost effect here. But the reality is this is the way I plot it. I could have made this abscess a, a lot shorter and this could have been almost flat, right? Depends on how you plot it. And uh, because the data are not coming from the same sources. So we don't really know exactly what it means. It's, uh, it's a little tricky yet. And some people became very worried and, sh and, and jump into conclusions. Like for example, just to illustrate that point, this is what happened in Wales in the year uh, in between 1997 and 2003. So uh, this is methadone in females, right? Patients that were on the MNTP, MNTP clinic. This is patients with uh, uh, heroin. These were um, uh, heroin uh, morphine male patients. And uh, so uh, they were worried because people were dying, right? If you look at the deaths related to uh, heroin and, mor and, and methadone, they were going up. So what they did is they stopped um, and what they did is they stopped the methadone clinics and they saw that the methadone uh, related deaths went down, but look at the heroin related deaths, they went up. And this is what happened here when they reopened the clinics again. So the deaths by heroin started to go down. So the, the message from this is that you cannot put every single patient in the same bag. We, 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 for trying to help some patients, you, you might be hurting them. So the answer for the problem that we have with methadone for patients with uh, with drug addiction and patients that are in a methadone clinic, it, it's different from the problematic that we have with pain, pain, pain patients, it's just different. You don't have too many options for these patients in the MNTP clinic. Maybe you can give uh, Suboxone, but you know, there are no clinics for Suboxone. Uh, they are only a limited number, so they cannot absorb all these patients. While in pain, the argument is that there are other opioids that sometimes you can use. So why taking the risk? So that again, this is just food for, for thought. So uh, what are the underlying mechanisms for this increase of death? First of all, some people are not that convinced that there is a, 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 a real increase in the death of uh, patients related to methadone. I think that there is an increase. I don't think that we understand it very well. And some people are arguing that is the QTC prolongation that may cause. Some other people are saying, well, what about syncope? And other people are arguing that sleep apnea induced by opioids, in this case methadone, might be contributing to that phenomenon. And the question is, what do we do? So uh, uh, some people look at this problem, and if you look at this paper by Stimmel in 1973, 
is an old question. People were worried about this years ago. And, uh, and they were looking at the QTC prolongation. And they observed QTC prolongation in 34% of the patients, as you can see here. And uh, then they dropped it. So the question is, this is 1973. And the next observation was by Krantz uh, uh, in 2002. What happened in between? Were we sleeping? What were we doing? So the, one of the possible answers for that is this is 1973, very close to when the MNTP clinics were uh, starting to, to function and serve patients. And so the doses were about 40 milligrams, between 10 and 40 milligrams. Then the studies that show that morbidity and mortality in MNTP clinics can decrease that actually came in the 80s and late 80s. So the doses in the MNTP clinics started climbing up, which is way after this study was done. So that might be one of the reasons why it wasn't done in the initial study. We wasn't seeing the acute, uh, the torsade points or more deaths at that point. So that's a possibility. So what is that that we are talking about here? So this is an action potential, and this is the rest and the resting membrane potential at minus 70. This is a myocyte. And what you have first, when you get the depolarization of the fiber, you get an influx of sodium that will uh, be responsible for this upstroke. And then you have calcium here that do, that's the plateau. And then is the potassium that is leaving the cell that brings back to the resting membrane potential. Once you're here, that can be excited again. So uh, when, when things go crazy for one reason or another, and the repolarization is affected, you can see this kind of uh, crazy repolarization pattern that end up in complications. So what is contributing to that mostly is the QT interval. This is a QRS complex obtained by an e EKG. And we are looking, what we are worried is about at the duration of this interval, which should be in between 450, 470 uh, males and females respectively. And uh, when you go beyond 500, then you add a very high risk or definite risk of torsade de point. So you have to be careful. And this is how it looks in, a, in, a, in, a, in um, an EKG. You shall see the EKG. You shall see the, the, Q, the, the QRS complex very nicely. But things can get a little ugly, as you see here. And you see an arrhythmia, and then eventually you can go into torsade de point, as you are seeing it here, that has a very high rate of mortality. So we have to understand that better. So wh what is causing this? Well, the reason for that is that the repolarization here that we, uh, we talked about before, uh, that is responsible the, the uh, potassium to bring it down, the, some agents will block these channels. And as a result, potassium cannot leave the cell, so it, it, it stays positive and it, it causes a prolongation of the action potential. Once the action potential prolongs, then you get at a risk of actually that this becomes this and this. So this is the underlying mechanism. What is the evidence for that? Well, to talk about evidence first, we have to understand what is a level of evidence, right? And so this is a pyramid that I find very, very helpful to understand where we are and why it's so difficult to answer certain questions that we have, particularly with methadone. So this is uh, the bottom of the pyramid, which is the lowest level of, of evidence. Obviously, if you are in vitro, is the lowest, then animal research, then you go to case reports, case series. Eventually, you go to and randomized double blind control studies, and then you can do a meta analysis of these studies, and this is the highest level of evidence. The problem with this is that to get a very good or a good meta analysis, you need very good randomized double blind control studies. Otherwise, you, whatever you put, if you put crappy data, you're going to get bad data out. There is no way to, to, to have it the other way around. So you have to be so critical when you look at a uh, meta-analysis, because you have to see what were the criteria that they use to select, to select the, the, the studies that are going to be to consider for the analysis. And this is the problem that we find, is that if we look at the data that, uh, that, you, that you can find uh, done with uh, methadone, uh, unfortunately, there are not too many uh, good uh, 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 double-blind control studies. This is another slide that we are uh, showing here, actually, is the report of, uh, of uh, deaths related to methadone. And uh, you see one, two, three cases here very early uh, before the year 2000. Then it starts going up in the year 2000. And then starts going even higher, the number of reports, and, and keeps going even higher the closer we get to 2002, which is when uh, Maurice Krantz did his contribution. <clears throat> 
And uh, the question that, that you asked then, you know, I, in the year 2008, actually it was 2005, I started to get, to get very worried about what to do with my patients. I didn't know what to do. So I said, well, it's very simple. I just go to literature, look what people are doing, and I do what most people do. You know, you look at a good journal, you go to the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, like Russ would say, and you have the answers there. But then what happens is that the literature was all over the place. So, look, isn't that fascinating? If you ask the question, what do you do with an EKG to prevent the risk of uh, QTC prolongation? Do you do an EKG? Well, some people will say, be vigilant for doses over 600 milligrams a day. What, what does it mean, vigilant? That when the patient stops breathing, then, then you start getting worried? I don't know what it means. Patient on high doses. So, 600 is not a high dose. So, wh wh where do you put the bar? Never necessary. It's, it's really pretty amazing to me. Consider EKG on high doses. Again, we don't know what it means. Consider EKG before starting every patient on method on QTC or on patients that are on medications that can prolong the QTC. That's another paper. EKG screening in, in patients at risk, especially after starting uh, drugs that will inhibit the metabolism of the drug. So that makes sense. But, it's, but again, there is not a list of the drugs. EKG for patients over 120 milligrams a day of methadone. So it, the literature is all over the place, just to give that, uh, that example that the range it goes from never necessary to consider EKG on everybody. So what the heck do we do with the patients? Uh, we, we just don't know what we're going to do with them. So as I was saying before, I got worried about these patients and I started looking at the literature and tried to find the level, a good level of evidence to make an educated decision, right? And what I, won, uh, what I found was prospective, cross-sectional, and retrospective studies that I'm showing here. There are a bunch of them, including uh, the one that we did. And uh, the quality is, is just not that great. And why, why is the quality not that great? Because most of these studies were <coughs> retrospective or they were cross-sectional. So they are not randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. You just do the best you can. So how come we manage, we started in 2003 to do this, this paper, how, how did we manage to do a cross-sectional study on something that is so relevant? Well, the reason is because no one had a clue of what was going on at that point. So that was a nice contribution back then. I wouldn't do it now because now we know a lot more. But so then this is interesting also because you have to refine the question, right? So you start with the methodology. You're not going to jump into a double-blind placebo-controlled study initially without having any idea on the power, on what you have to do, what patient population, who is at risk. So this is, all these papers help for that. What well, it didn't help that much is to understand what is the prevalence. Because since it's cross-sectional or it's retrospective, obviously if the patient died, didn't come that day to the visit to your office, right? So that you are missing that one. So all the all the deaths we missed, which is actually the primary outcome. That's what we are interested in. So this is the limitations with the type of data. It, they can be helpful, but uh, they have these limitations. And then this is uh, just look at the at the numbers that some people reported of uh, QTC duration over a, uh, over 500 that put the patients at risk. So you can see that there are some of these studies that show that. And then there are uh, studies that are case reports that this is the study by Kranz, and then you have other studies that show prolongation of the QTC. So this is also to help you. Uh, then to deal with the, the conundrum of what you do with these patients. So you have to be aware of what are the medications that have the possibility of affecting the QTC um, of the patient as well, in addition to methadone. The patient is on 2.5 milligrams once a day and has a QTC prolongation. Well, just look at the other meds. Maybe it's not methadone, the one that is causing it, right? So we need to to uh, be aware of that. And this is, again, this is uh, just a classification of where different drugs are. And this is to uh, put it into perspective, basically. So that's why I'm moving forward. Then, then it is interesting because, you know, when I, 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 I left this on purpose, I was going to change it at some point, but I left it. And uh, methadone is, is, is here on improbable, right? In this classification of a very respectable uh, website that follows this very closely. But uh, now if you, if you ask people now, well, they move it up, most likely possible to probable. So that's how people are feeling at this point. So that's how dynamic these things are. So uh, I, I don't want to take more time because I think that it would be nice to go and move into the, into the discussion of the cases. But I, I just wanted to uh, raise the awareness for those that are not that uh, familiar with the drug. It's a great drug. We just have to know how to use it, and we have to be careful with it. And uh, don't hesitate to write a grant. 
and, uh, and maybe you can clarify this situation a little bit better for us. Okay, thank you very much. All right. So uh, why don't we why don't we go now to the case discussions? Uh, we have uh, we have two presenters from here and one from Colombia, so maybe we can do one, one, and one. Okay. that this is you. So uh, there are several ways to do this, obviously. Uh, I think that is, is, at least my experience when we did this type of exercise, is that you know, we present a little bit and then we discuss that piece, see how people would do it, because there are so many, so many different ways and sometimes we can approach the same patient, and I think that that's, that's the purpose of the exercise, all right? In other words, I'm going to be picking on some of you as the uh, slideshow goes on, okay? My name is Hector Miranda. I'm one of the pain fellows at BI. Okay, so we have here a 42-year-old gentleman initially seen at our pain clinic by Dr. Cruciani on September 9, 2008. Chief complaints, worsening low back pain, uh, constant and worsened with uh, physical activity. Baseline, five, out of six, 5 to 6 out of 10, and can be 8 to 9 out of 10 with minimal activity. It's uh, radicular in nature and associ associated with numbness and tingling in the lower extremities. Uh, Nathan, <laughs> you're the only name I remember. What do you What do you think is going on here with this patient right here? What do you suspect? Differential diagnosis. Just one. I think it could be uh, spinal cord Okay, that's that's good. Your name? I forget. Elvis. So what else do you think aside from? say, lumbar spinal stenosis, 42-year-old man, what else could you think it can be? Okay. If it were a vascular claudication, what other kind of history would you be suspecting this patient? There you go. Maybe a smoker, right? And what other question would you ask um, Seraphine to this patient? I mean, anything else you'd like to know? Basically, is it working? Can you hear me there? So we're going to pass it around. So because you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any associated symptoms relieving or worse? So uh, physical activity says it makes it worse. He says that it's he's sort of okay. Uh, just lying in bed. He denies any <coughs> saddle anesthesia, any loss of bowel incontinence. Okay. Red, fl red flags. Uh, no red flags. Maybe weakness. Weakness in the lower extremities for a plus out of five. So this is what he was taken from the other doctor that was seeing him prior to him coming to us, Percocet, every four hours, two tablets, methadone, 30 milligrams every three hours. Oxycodone, 60 to 90 every three hours, dilated, 16 milligrams every four hours, and all these medications provided suboptimal pain relief. He tried a fentanyl patch, but he had the side effect of shortness of breath. Lyrica caused him to uh, cause him weight gain. Neurontin provided no relief at all. TENS unit, nothing marvelous. Uh, he had a total of nine epidural steroid injections. We only provided mild, short-lasting pain relief. Uh, any suggestions as to what else you think we can try in this patient in terms of management? Well, you don't have a diagnosis yet, so it's difficult yeah. to try medication. Okay. Well, we don't have a diagnosis yet, so it's, I think it would be difficult to say what we would try not knowing what the etiology of the problem is. Assuming that it were lumbar stenosis, like you said before, uh, 42 years old, takes this amount of medication. I, think, I mean, I think a surgical evaluation at that time, if it really was spinal stenosis, a okay. 42-year-old uh, guy. Okay. That's fair. Well, oh. So he has a past medical history of hypertension, uh, surgical history of gastric bypass years prior to the initial visit. Uh, with dumping syndrome, uh, he has a history of lumbar discectomy and laminectomy in 1999, as well as a right knee arthroscopic surgery twice, actually. 
So what kind of problem do you foresee in a patient with uh, dumping syndrome sort of post gastric bypass surgery? What do you think? Do you think that this may be an issue in terms of him getting pain relief with, uh, let's say, long-acting medications versus short-acting medications? Adam, any thoughts? Yes, correct. <laughs> So the question was, oh. yeah, the fact that he has set up post gastric bypass surgery. Uh, well, the uh, absorption would certainly be different, um, and it might explain why he was uh, short of breath on a maybe equivalent uh, dose of fentanyl patch earlier. Okay. So. That's fair. Social history, he's married and he has four kids. Um, <clears throat> So focus uh, psychiatric evaluation. He was mightly depressed on initial presentation, full affect, no delusions, no hallucinations, no suicide, no uh, suicidal ideations, no high risk for suicide with opioid medications. So physical exam, uh, he was alert, uh, oriented times three, sensation decreased uh, to light touch and pinprick uh, to the left leg in an L5 and S1 dermatomal distribution. Babinski was negative bilaterally, no clonus. Uh, deep tendon reflexes uh, decreased in the lower extremities. Strength, five out of five uh, in all muscles tested except for left knee extensors and ankle dorsiflexors, which were for a plus out of five. This goes more with uh, radiculopathic, uh, radiculopathic presentation. Uh, his gait was antalgic due to the back pain. On musculoskeletal exam, uh, there was no atrophy, no asymmetry, no erythema, no swelling, or signs of infection, nor structural abnormalities. Tenderness to a patient in the lumbar paraspinal muscles. Maybe another diagnosis to consider in this patient is uh, failed back surgery syndrome. Uh, range of motion was decreased in lumbar flexion and extension due to the pain. Uh, facet loading was positive on the right and left. <coughs> Straight leg raise was negative, and the seated root, root test was negative as well, bilaterally. The reason why we ordered a cervical MRI, I skipped the slide or I put it in later, was that after we started treating him, he developed uh, neck pain uh, that was asymmetric in terms of its radicular nature. Uh, C4, C5, mild, mild anal bulge with uh, so associated specific ridge broad-based left paracentral disc herniation, causing moderate uh, canal stenosis, C5-6, diffuse annular, annular bulge with associated ossific ridge and superimposed broad-based central disc herniation with ligamentum flavum thickening contributing to mild canal stenosis, C6-7, C7-T1, no disc herniation and no abnormalities below that level. So what we did for this patient, uh, his methadone was titrated up, uh, Percocet was continued, the uh, roxycodone and dilaudid were discontinued. Uh, the patient eventually was started to report in serious onset of neck pain, like I mentioned, and that's why we ordered the MRI uh, associated with headaches and neck muscle spasms not relieved with the medication regimen he was on at this time. He also referred bilateral arm numbness, uh, right arm on the left, and the MRI, as I discussed earlier, Cervical epidurals for this patient provided only mild pain relief, and Dr. Gruciani started on Valium, which did provide pain relief uh, for this patient. Anything else you would, you would try for his neck pain, aside from Valium, any other kind of modality? I think that uh, maybe I can uh, uh, add a little bit because I had the advantage of having seen this patient for, for a long time. So I, I guess that one of the points that I would make here is that when uh, I had this patient referred to us, uh, he was in, uh, in excruciating pain. The pain was, uh, I would say, eight uh, uh, in a numeric scale, zero to 10, and the pain increased with activity, activity being getting off the chair and just walking a few steps. And what, what it was hard to understand is that uh, he was, at that point, on a relatively uh, low dose of methadone. How do I define, or how I did define it at that point that way, is that the pain was not well controlled. He didn't have side effects. 
and uh, the QTC was okay. So uh, uh, that's to me is the definition that uh, if the, assuming that the patient uh, doesn't have any other comorbidities, that doesn't have aberrant behavior related to the medication, doesn't have history of drug abuse, et cetera, et cetera. But let's say it's just a straightforward uh, pain patient as this is the case with this gentleman. Then you just uh, can help to wonder why is that the medications were not titrated up? If they were worried about methadone, why was not an opioid rotation done at that point? Why not? Why this patient was in so much pain when he came to see me? So that that's what I had to struggle at the beginning, trying to define which uh, uh, route to follow. And the reason why I increased the methadone is because in my mind, if uh, I like to exhaust whatever the medication the patient is on before moving to something else, so there were no side effects, patient was in pain, QTC was okay, well, let's see how much pain relief we can get with the methadone then. And uh, that was the rationale at that point. And uh, if we can go back to, yes. your, to your point. So this patient uh, also developed... Sorry, your point were muscle relaxants, right? You were talking about volume, and you were talking about volume. And, and yeah, for said, the muscle spasms. Right. And the other reason why I use volume in this patient... Uh, the reason why I'm interrupting because it's more fun, I think, if I tell you what I saw when, <laughs> sure. when I saw him that day because I remember this patient well, is that he had uh, headaches. He broke a headache that I, I could really not understand too well. And uh, to the, when I did the physical exam uh, that day, then I noticed also that he had some weakness in the right upper extremity that suggested a C4, C5 radiculopathy. So I thought that maybe the headache that he was experiencing that was uh, more uh, in the occipital region and then would generalize as a migraine, perhaps was triggered at that region. And when you examine the, uh, the neck, it, the muscle spasms were very prominent. So I could perhaps gone with any other muscle relaxant at that point, but in the past he had no good experiences with them. And I also found that to break a headache sometimes, actually, benzos are, are, are helpful, particularly when you have the occipital component to it. So that was, again, that was the rationale at that point. Okay. Yes. So you already tried flexural and... Well, at that, at that he came with a, a headache that it was relatively new in onset, was very intense, and uh, it wasn't really breaking up. I ended up doing an MRI of the head because oh. I, I didn't understand the headache too well. And at that point, he has decreased visual acuity as well, accompanying the headache. So I was kind of worried. Uh, maybe there was an increase on intracranial pressure. Maybe there was demyelinating disease. There, the ban a bunch of things that could be happening at that point. But, uh, uh, but I had on top of my list uh, that uh, this was perhaps triggered by muscle spasms in the neck. And also, I thought that, the, that uh, a course of steroids could be helpful uh, to help with the, perhaps with the uh, 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 cause for the radiculopathy that we, he was having that I suspected at that point that maybe he slipped another disc because he had multiple disc problems at different levels of the spine. Okay. So why would this patient develop, say, low testosterone at such a young age? Why? Anybody know? Or care to? Dr. Kaplan? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Just wanted to make that point. That the opiates uh, will in about 30, 40% of patients will uh, reduce your testosterone level. Good, good answer. <laughs> yeah, okay, just wanted to make that point. So uh, subsequent care, methadone eventually was uh, peaked at 100 milligram PO, QID, roxycodone, 60 to 90, POQ three hours. Uh, after the ne neck pain worsened, he was rotated from the methadone to the exalgo, which is a long acting form of dilated uh, 112 milligrams POBID. Repeat back surgery was mentioned to the patient as well as spinal cord simulator trial, but he preferred to continue with uh, conservative management. Um, these medication adjustments helped improve his quality of life and his ability to cope with his pain and continue to raise his four children. Any questions? I do not know the answer to that question. Another question. I don't know. The question was, what was the anatomy of his lumbar spine? Did we see an MRI of this patient, Dr. Ruscia? He didn't see one in the, in the chart. I believe that the medical term for that is awful. It was really <laughs> in a really bad shape. So this guy, actually, the way that he got hurt, he was working uh, at the airport. And uh, what happened is that one of the containers got loose in a ramp, so it started coming down from one of the tracks. 
into a person that was looking the other way around. So he went and put himself trying to stop it against the wall, and he got crushed against the wall. Against the wall, and he injured his neck and injured his lower back. As a result of the injury, he had compromise, acute compromise of the spinal cord, and he underwent emergency surgery for the compression, and then eventually he underwent uh, a fusion of the lumbar spine. And uh, the, the uh, cervical spine was relatively okay for several years, but eventually uh, it started showing uh, uh, some radiculopathy, probably discogenic disease, and uh, but that's what I found with the MRI that I did after he developed weakness of the right upper extremity. Well, yeah, the question is if I did another MRI. Yeah, I did the MRI at that point. This is about, I want to say, three months ago when he developed that weakness, the new onset weakness on the right, on the right arm. That with, uh, with, uh, with the lumbar spine, he had, uh, I, I, I've been seeing him maybe for six years, and once in a while, yeah, I repeat the images depending if there is a new, uh, a new, uh, uh, a deficit or something that, that is different, and yeah, I repeat it, but I don't do an MRI all the time if, unless there is a change in the, in the physical exam. Wait, wait. If it is a good question, you can do it on the mic. <laughs> a patient that comes with chronic low back pain and radicular pain to the clinic that was managed by somebody else, do you do an MRI or not on the lumbar spine? I think you should. I mean, if you didn't have an MRI in the last year, maybe there's something changed if it came to you. I'll, I'll disagree a little just for the sake of disagreeing. Um, you sound like my wife. Oh, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's the why, why else do we get married? Um, it, because I, I guess, you know, we didn't hear this, the whole story here. We heard half a story because we're having fun. but So we don't really know what happened from the time of injury to the time of surgery, and then what happened for the, you said surgery was 98 or something, yeah, and this yeah. was 90, 2008 or 2006, so we don't really know what happened for the interim eight or 10 years, but if this patient gave you a story of exactly the same kind of complaints for 10 years, and you had imaging studies within that that showed no change, and his symptoms didn't change, one could argue, if things haven't changed, why re-image? So I think, you know, you could argue, I could argue it that way. Because I like to argue. <laughs> it's more fun than Republican debate so far. So another question then is, why did he come to you? Why did he change from other doctor? The answer is obvious. I am awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, when, if I treat somebody that on this amount of medication that he failed treatment and then I want to change, do something else, I would like to see an, MR, an MRI. Spinal cord stimulator, something else, maybe not the surgery, it's much better in my mind than doing, they're giving me more and more medications and risking all kinds of side effects. Maybe, maybe he could uh, have another fusion, maybe in 10 or 15 years since then, Beside that one surgeon, maybe not. There are other surgeons that will do something different. But, but you want an MRI first to see what's going on with the back. his old images, and if things haven't changed, I wouldn't order new ones, but you would look at the MRI, right? You'd look yeah. at the, you'd know that if he had a fusion, he's going to probably have degenerative changes above. He might have scar tissue. They already checked his CBC to make sure he wasn't, because he had a gastric bypass, he didn't have B12 deficiency as the etiology of his ongoing leg pain, but you're going to look at all that and then make a decision. Maybe he has arachnoiditis, maybe have something else, I don't know. Arachnoiditis, maybe he developed a tumor. I mean, I, I don't know. He's a young guy, 42 only, with all this amount of pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, no, but to, to answer to that point, I agree with you. If you see, uh, when, I, when I get someone like this, if they don't have a recent uh, imaging, most likely 
I will end up doing it. So uh, with this guy, uh, uh, he has relatively recent MRIs, relatively recent MRIs. And uh, I, I wouldn't repeat it now, another MRI, unless there is a change in the, in the exam. But I, I agree with you. You have to, you have to uh, more or less know what's going on. Yeah, no, no question about that. Now, but I'm in, more inclined to Michael's position, which is I, I usually go more by a clinical uh, 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 presentation. And uh, if, uh, if I already understand what's going on with one image, I wouldn't repeat it unless there is a change. For example, he had, I'm sorry, just this is the last comment. You said he had positive um, facet signs, right? Loading yeah. facets. For example, why not try uh, radio frequency? Or why not? <laughs> I mean, it depends how it was presented. <laughs> yeah, just to go over the mic. So he, he didn't want procedures. So just to stir, pot, stir the pot a little bit more on a different topic, which I think is important to bring up for the fellows, is that, um, so I think we've, we've basically learned today that you like drugs that are cheap and long acting. So, because you chose method, I'm sorry, right. No, no, but I'm, 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 in all seriousness, so we, we've, you chose methadone and then you chose Valium. And so I think we should make you defend that choice to the fellows because you're using two drugs that are long acting and you do have to worry about on high doses about respiratory depression in this guy. Yeah, I think, I think that is a great point. I think that with the Valium, we kind of discussed it before. I think that with, with Valium, we kind of discussed it before. With methadone, in, in general, if I see a neuropathic component, we know that 50% of the patients will respond to opioids, right? Uh, even though if they have neuropathic pain. There are no data that shows that one opioid is better than others. There are no head-to-head -head comparisons. So I go more, more by my clinical experience. In my clinical experience, I have the fantasy that methadone, when there is a neuropathic pain, has the chance to be more beneficial than other opioids. And the reason is because of the blockade of the NMDA receptors. And uh, so in that way, you, you might be able to be uh, blocking hyperalgesia. And the other thing that I'm worried about in the long-term patients on opioids is the development of tolerance. So uh, some people have suggested, like Huda, Kiel, and Trujillo, that the NMDA receptors might be uh, involved into the development, uh, development of uh, tolerance. Uh, at, le at least in the, in the animal model. In the human model, it's not that clear that they are. But then that's, that's my, my, own, uh, my own bias. So for example, when I have a patient that I'm treating with a long-acting medication, a different opioid, let's say morphine, oxycodone, in, in an ex extended form release, uh, then uh, if I notice that I have to push the dose too quickly in the absence of changes in the physical exam that suggests that there is development of tolerance, then what I, what I found, in, again, this is only a clinical observation, that the addition of methadone at a low dose tend to stabilize these patients. And there are two possible uh, explanations for that. One is the placebo effect for the patient and for myself. And uh, the other one is that uh, some data from, for example, Pasternak, they show that there might be a synergistic effect when you uh, mix uh, different agonists, mu agonists. So perhaps we are getting some synergistic effect. And the other one is that maybe you are actually blocking the NMDA receptors with the methadone, and then you are stabilizing the dose of the methadone because you are preventing further developing of, uh, of tolerance. So this is the, my, my rationale for in this particular patient uh, to, to use methadone. The, when I uh, uh, saw this patient for the first time, he was on methadone, but I would have chosen most likely methadone to treat him also. He's a young fellow also, I didn't know him. I, I, I must say that I was a little bit uh, uh, uncomfortable at the beginning uh, with him, I, and I cannot tell you exactly why. And I had to make a clinical decision there if I felt that there was a risk for diversion or not. And then it was a patient that I was going to look in the long term. Then I had an opportunity to uh, study better his behavior, look at urine toxicologies um, uh, over time. And actually, he was never a problematic patient. If anything, I would say that ended up being one of my best patients, which is interesting how uh, you can be uh, fooled sometimes, right? One way or another. But I, just 
the other thing I was pointing out about cheap and long acting was you decided to use Valium with that. And I think it's probably a good point to talk about for the fellows about what went through your head, especially choosing the combination of opioid and benzo um, and, and your worries about it because certainly that, there's been a lot discussed about using it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I thank you very much for, for thinking that I do think before I do the things that is not just a reflex. And then <laughs> the volume uh, is uh, like Dr. Uh, Kaplan, for example, probably, I don't know if he changed his mind, but it's a drug that as a muscle relaxant, uh, uh, we, we, we liked. And I like the fact that it's long acting because then it doesn't give you the highs and lows that you may experience with other drugs. On the other extreme would be Xanax, for example, which is a drug that I tend to avoid uh, specifically for, for those reasons. Now, in terms of the, the other question was the long acting, the, the, the methadone well, that is the cheap. Risk, the risk of that. Right, the risk exactly. Of that. So there are data now that were uh, published by, the, by um, um, Webster, uh, Lynn Webster, um, I would say two years ago, that what he did is he um, accrued patients that were on opioids. And what he did was sleep studies on these patients. And what he found is that uh, the patients that were on opioids were, uh, 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 were experiencing more frequently sleep apnea than patients that were not on opioids. And when he dissected the, this patient population, what he found is that the patients on methadone had actually a higher tendency to experience sleep apnea. And then furthermore, he observed that the patients on methadone and benzos uh, combined were even a higher risk. So that's something that, that really uh, it, it opened up my, my eyes. So this patient uh, was in these medications before I was aware of this paper. I, and and uh, perhaps I would have done it anyway, but I wouldn't have sleep at night. And at that point, I wasn't that worried. And the, unless you take the same drug, exactly, which sometimes is helpful. So <laughs> the, the problem with, uh, with the study by, by Lynn is that it was not a prospective study. So it has all the limitations of the cross-sectional studies. And sometimes when we hear this, uh, this uh, type of findings that are so alarming, we, we tend to jump the gun and we just uh, go to the other extreme. So I think that it is the study that he did is extremely helpful because uh, again, raises the awareness on other areas that we were not focusing on. But I think that a definite study definitely needs to be done before we can make any strong conclusions on that. It, was that the, the point that you were telling me to go? Okay. <laughs> Finally. It wasn't easy, eh? Yes. When you find that some of your patients have sleep apnea, do you refer them to a prosthodontist for an appliance, an evaluation, um, after they've had a sleep study? That um, maybe a, an appliance would be helpful. You're not changing any medication. You're not adding anything, but you're cutting down on the, uh, the problem there. I think that this is a very good point. What I usually do is I do send them for a sleep study. My experience has been that the uh, physicians that do this type of discipline, they, they hate the medications that, that we use. Mm -hmm. And so their, their gut reaction is to tell the patients to stop all the medications they are taking, <laughs> take the pain, and, and just figure it out. And so it's, it's not that simple to uh, work that problem out. And so uh, uh, what I do actually is, well, I encourage the patient to look for it, uh, to do another sleep study to someone that we can work with. Sometimes it takes a couple of studies until you find someone that is more open to this. And then I make an effort really to cut down the medication. Uh, most of these, uh, of these patients end up with... Uh, with uh, CPAP and, uh, and uh, oxygen at night and all these type of things. But I make an effort to cut down the, the medication and see how far we can go. Sometimes you have patients, you know, you treat them for years, they are doing relatively okay. And, uh, and then you, you know, you just don't do that. You know, it, but, it, but it is, some patients heal. Most patients don't, but some patients do heal. And uh, I had an experience with a patient actually, as a matter of fact, that I was escalating of the dose of, uh, of oxycodone extended release for a long time, combination with diluted for a, uh, I don't even know if it was a piriformis uh, uh, syndrome, but it looked like it, but I couldn't treat it. I, I, I sent the patients for uh, injections and, and the deep massage, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, the pain was still there. 
And uh, so I, I eventually ended up with higher doses. And then uh, the husband started to notice that uh, she was snoring at night and that she was waking up and that she, was, uh, she wasn't uh, uh, having a restful sleep. But this was in, a, I would say, five-year period. So uh, then she was doing better pain-wise. So we, uh, we, we did a sleep study. I went through that experience that I just mentioned before. And then I started trying to cut down on the medications. And we were able to cut down by 70%. And uh, as a result, her sleep is better, the sleep pattern is better, and, uh, and uh, uh, she's functioning better during the day because she's less uh, drugged, et cetera. Such an important question, an important point, important question in the sense that I think when we see patients, if they're not sleeping well, we tend to think that it's pain that's waking them up. And we probably don't screen enough patients about sleep apnea or ask questions relevant to sleep apnea in our day-to-day -day practice. Because um, there aren't a lot of patients who walk in and say, I have sleep apnea, and you're lucky if you have someone who's a, an observant spouse who can give you that information. But it's probably something we need to look for um, much more rut routinely. I will propose now to move to the next case, so we have an opportunity to uh, discuss. Uh, wait a second. This gentleman is going to ask. What are your slides? This one? Yes. Okay. Sure. All right. Hi, my uh, my presentation isn't quite as isn't quite in the same format as Dr. Miranda's, but I think it still should lead to some interesting discussion. Um, the topic is low-pressure headache and chiropractic manipulation. It's a case study. Um, so we'll go on to the case. The case is 49-year-old female with no significant past medical history, presents with non-radiating postural bilateral occipital headache that began in December 2010, the same day after a chiropractic procedure. That procedure was a drop-down table and a Thompson maneuver on her lumbar spine. Uh, patients sort of reported progressive worsening of headache symptoms, um, over time until she came to see us in our clinic. Um, sort of relevant other information that she provided during her first visit was that she had a throbbing headache, worse with standing for prolonged periods of times, and also with straining. The headache was relieved uh, while she was laying flat, and um, she did not wake up in the morning with this headache. It was only after she was getting up, brushing her teeth, sort of starting her daily activities when she started experiencing this headache. Um, she also denied any sort of other... Um, associated symptoms such as diplopia, tinnitus, photophobia, neck stiffness, or nausea and vomiting. Also of note, when, she, when we first saw her physical exam was pretty, pretty benign, cervical um, range, of, next range of motion was completely normal, she had no tender points, um, cranial nerve exam was completely intact, completely normal, and there was really, really nothing remarkable except for her presentation. Imaging was done um, on this patient, an MRI of the C-spine, which just showed small left paramedian disc herniation, C5, C6. She wasn't really complaining of any uh, radicular symptoms. And also showed an extension of the uh, cerebellar tonsils below the level of the foramen magnum. She also had an MRI lumbar spine done later, which showed no evidence of any CSF leak and some small multi-level disc herniations. Um, about halfway through her treatment with us, she also had a CT myelogram which showed a diverticula at the left T10 nerve root sleeve. But uh, on the myelogram, there was also still no CSF leak. Just to show you an example, this isn't her CT myelogram, but um, this is what a diver. Oh, sorry. This is, what a, this is what a diverticula would look like on a CT myelogram. Oops, sorry. Uh, sure. So the question was, why was she going uh, undergoing chiropractic manipulation in the first place? Um, it's because she had had long-standing back pain, had never seen a pain doctor, and like many people in America, first thing they do is they try. Um, chiro they, she went to a chiropractor. Uh, unrelated. To the Unrelated, and actually, I believe she had 
been seeing a chiropractor for many years and never had any problems and actually found it quite helpful. It was just after this one visit in December 2010 when she started developing these symptoms and soon thereafter stopped going to see the chiropractor. Uh, treatment course while she was being seen in our clinic um, was, you know, because she had a postural headache, um, we decided to do two cervical epidural blood patches without any relief. Um, she came back later to have two lumbar epidural blood patches, which provided some minimal relief, three days and four days of complete relief, and then she had a return of her same symptoms. At that point, that's when we ordered the CT myelogram with the results that we saw, and the decision was made to sort of um, start injecting at the thoracic level, T11, T12. Uh, that provided some longer relief um, in terms of complete relief, and she just came back uh, two days ago for another injection, so we'll wait to see. The thing that's important, though, is even though she didn't have complete relief of her symptoms, she did report a 90% improvement since, the, since we gave her the, the second lumbar epidural blood patch. I also forgot to mention that sort of before she came to see us, she was trying conservative therapy with analgesics, just bed rest, um, other sort of typical conservative therapies for people who have postural headaches. Uh, just to go have a little brief information about um, low CSF pressure headaches, also known as spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, it's an obviously an uncommon condition characterized by low CSF pressure and postural headache in the absence of any sort of meningeal puncture. Um, brief history, first proposed by Shelton Brand in 1938, so we actually knew about this phenomenon for quite a, quite a long time. Some other interesting history, probably more for people who do lots of OB anesthesia. Quinky performed the first LP in 1898, and Beer, um, Dr. Beer reported the first post-LP headache um, 10 years later. The definition, this is not, you know, spontaneous, spontaneous intracranial hypotension is not an unknown disease process. The International Classification of Headache Disorders actually recognizes this as an actual headache, and this is sort of their definition. Uh, just to go over it quickly, diffuse or dull headaches that worsen within 15 minutes after sitting or standing with at least one of the following symptoms, neck stiffness, tinnitus, hypoacusia, which is partial deafness, photophobia, nausea. You also have to have at least one of the other following um, criteria, evidence of low CSF pressure on MRI, evidence of CSF leak, CSF pressure less than 60 millimeters water in sitting position, normal being 70 to 200. Um, as expected, you can't have a history of a dural puncture or other causes of CSF fistulas that could form and um, headache that resolves within 72 hours after epidural blood patching. Of course, these rules never really apply to reality, but uh, they are a good guideline. Some epidemiology, um, even though it is a recognized form of headache, it's really sort of underreported. Um, one study sh showing that there have been less than 75 cases reported um, by 1995. The incidence is pretty rare, five in 100,000 most common in people ages 40 to 50, and more common in women by a two to one margin. Uh, the symptoms, as we went over, are typical of postural headaches, also include neck stiffness, nausea, diplopia, vertigo, dizziness, tinnitus. Um, it's also interesting to note that during the course of the illness, the postural component may disappear. It can actually just pr present as a chronic daily dull headache. And there's also s some reports of a paradoxical headache, meaning, um, it gets worse with laying down and is actually better when standing up. Etiology, you know, most of it is just theoretical, but people propose that it's either spontaneous or trauma-related, rupture of the meningeal diverticula or cyst, um, which is what this, uh, pa uh, this patient did have a diverticula on CT myelogram. You can also have a tear or a dehiscence of the nerve root, commonly located in the cervical thoracic and the thoracal lumbar junction. And the two main risk factors people have found are trauma, which you know, chiropractic manipulation could be a form of trauma and weakness in the dural sac, which is most commonly found in people with connective tissue disorders like Marfan syndromes. There's case reports of that, and also patients with um, Ehlers-Danos syndrome. Um, just to go into chiropractic manipulation, some of the major, major complications, you know, there's obviously reports, and it's well documented that patients can have arterial dissection, stroke, phrenic nerve injury, myelopathy, epidural hematomas. 
in general, imaging can help in the diagnosis of um, spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, CT the, CTs of the brains can show subdural fluid collections, tentorial herniations. In this patient, um, her CAT scan did show, or sorry, her MRI C spine did show um, her cerebellar tonsils were below the level of the foramen magnum. CT myelogram is sort of the gold standard in terms of localizing the source of the CSF leak. Unfortunately, this patient, even though she had a diverticular at the T10 nerve root, there was no real evidence of CSF leak. MRI with contrast also can be very helpful. You can see meningeal enhancement over the cranial convexity, um, cerebellar tonsil displacement, and subdural fluid collection. Treatment, uh, treatment for these has also sort of been the same as it's been for decades for all sorts of um, um, intracranial hypotensive uh, headache symptoms, conservative therapy. You can do an epidural blood patch, um, the mechanism being compression tamponade of the dura or a sealing effect of the dural defect. Um, there have been a few case reports of people using epidural fibrin sealant patches. Um, it provides a watertight dural closure. It's something that neurosurgeons have been using for years um, when they do craniotomies and they have sort of dural defects that um, that they feel need to be sort of, you know, have a better have a better watertight seal than can be provided with suturing. The fibrin glue, for those of you who don't know, it's a mixture of two solutions. One solution is fibrinogen factor eight, fibronectin, apertinin, plasminogen, and the other solution is thrombin calcium. And it's actually two separate syringes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Which you may have seen sometimes neurosurgeons use in the OR. Uh, once they mix together, it becomes a glue and it actually is a uh, pretty uh, potent adhesive. Sort of the last line treatment, which I think is pretty rarely, rarely used is surgical intervention, um, ligation of meningeal diverticula, or you can actually do epidural space packing. Epidural blood patches. For people who do have spontaneous intracranial hypotension, the most important thing to really consider is where you want to where you want to actually do the um, epidural blood patch. I think most people, because people have headaches, they tend to start with cervical epidural blood patches. But, um, but in fact, as I mentioned, in her, in this patient, for example, it actually didn't help her twice. It was probably the worst, the worst of the epidural blood, blood patches in terms of relieving her symptoms. Um, as I also mentioned, the most common s sources of sort of um, diverticula along the spinal spinal cord is sort of at the cervical thoracic and the thoracic lumbar um, junction. The risk of ZBPs, um, also compression of the spinal cord and nerve, nerve roots, chemical meningitis, intrathecal injection of blood, and neck stiffness. Um, how effective are EBPs? Epidural blood patches haven't really been well studied in the setting of spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, there was one, one sort of study done by Diaz where 16 patients received epidural blood patches. Three, three out of the 16 had no resolution three sort of required multiple, multiple epidural blood patches, but did eventually have resolution. There's another paper by Hanners et al., also with, unfortunately, a low low end value, only 12 patients. The th interesting about this study was that um, they all had um, CT myelograms, and this sort of the site of CSF leak was really unknown. And so they sort of, um, they sort of arbitrarily gave cervical thoracic or, or lumbar epidural blood patches and um, it was interesting to, for them to find out that 75% of the patients who had cervical thoracic epidural blood patches had resolution of their pain symptoms, whereas only 13% of the patients who had lumbar epidural blood patches um, had resolutions of their headache symptoms. Um, sort of in summary, SIH is a rare phenomenon. You know, the incidence is five in 100,000. History and physical obviously presents with the typical postural headaches and associated symptoms, usually of unclear etiology. In this case, um, it was chiropractic manipulation. MRI and brain and CT myelograms may be helpful in the diagnosis. And epidural blood patches are still the standard of care, unless there is an and unless there is an identifiable CSF leak on imaging, it's best idea to try thoracic or cervical epidural bl blood patches rather than the more conventional lumbar epidural blood blood patches that we do for, uh, for example, with patients who have LP post LP um, related dural puncture headache. Um, I think the interesting sort of thing, these are the references, the interesting thing about this presentation is sort of more involved in, you know, how many people go to see chiropractors um, and get all these sort of uh, procedures done. There was one study in a Canadian paper where they actually have better access to data because of their national healthcare system. 
where in a five-year span, there was 134 million chiropractic procedures performed. Um, you know, the incidence of spontaneous intracranial hypotension is also very small. It's only five in 100,000. But um, it leads to the question that should chiropractors maybe um, get, besides getting just plain x-rays, should they get MRIs to sort of pre-screen patients who might have some sort of issues in their sort of dura or be more prone to perhaps getting spontaneous intracranial hypotensive headaches? Um, I don't know. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that on that issue. Yes? I was just curious as to whether this specific patient had a propensity to develop this problem based on your assessment. So she, you know, she didn't have any sort of, nothing at all. I mean, really, it's not well studied, but the two main risk factors are basically trauma and connective tissue disorders. She didn't have connective tissue disorders, but 33% of patients who present with um, spontaneous intracranial hypotension do have some sort of trauma. Uh, whether it be a motor vehicle accident or something like chiropractic manipulation, which I never really truly understood until I saw a YouTube video and actually saw what the drop-down table maneuver is like. It's pretty, you know, it can be pretty, it, it doesn't look so benign, actually, when you actually, when you actually see it. But uh, I thought it was interesting because how many of our patients have seen a chiropractor or see a chiropractor while we're, they're receiving treatment? Um, and I thought this was just an interesting, interesting case. You said that she had other chiropractor uh, manipulations. Was it the same type or that was a new type of manipulation? Uh, very similar, actually. She had been getting it for, for quite a few years. just happened that this time, you know, there's definitely a... a so the rubber band b broke. <laughs> the rubber band broke, yes. This is sort of a bad luck outcome, and I think... I think because because the incidence is so low, you know, it's not something that commonly happens. Um, you know, this this article is not sort of to or presentation is not to bash chiropractor, or say that they that they do bad things, but just to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes sometimes bad things happen. Since um, we are talking about bad things that can happen with a chiropractor, I think that the other thing to take into consideration with this type of manipulation is the dissection of the that common carotid. Yeah. That I've never seen. Just a, a couple questions, Manit. So since you raised the point, should patients be pre-screened, let me ask you, if you pre-screen them, what would you specifically be looking for uh, on imaging studies that would uh, lead you to stay away? Sure. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's not usually a standard of care to get CT myelograms on every patient. Um, but I think... I think the most common one and the one that some studies that sort of looked at a bunch of um, MRIs basically showed that uh, the, the sort of cerebellar tonsils sinking in the frame and magnum is actually a, has a high correlation with, um, actually, no, sorry. Um, that, that's a, yeah, the question is what's the, what's the chicken and egg there, right? <sighs> yes, that's true. I think at this point, all you can really sort of observe in a patient who doesn't, uh, not presenting with the symptoms beforehand is if they have diverticula um, at any of the nerve roots. But not an easy question. Now we don't really know that the diverticula are the source of the leak, do we? No, not always. Do we have any idea what, I mean, because then the question becomes, what's the incidence of diverticula among the general population, and is it different in this group of patients than it is um, in this population versus the general population? Sure. Any ideas? Uh, actually, no idea. And the, I guess the only question, the other question I have, a couple more, if I can bug you, and I can because you're mine. Of course. Um, <laughs> and did you come across anything about cisternography or uh, nuclear medicine studying as a source of, of trying to make the diagnosis? I think, yes. So um, CT cisterno radiography is also can be used, but I think most people most of the studies now sort of point to CT myelogram as sort of the gold standard. But yes, you can, uh, a lot of the studies did use um, cisternal radiography as an, Im as an imaging modality to detect, detect leaks. But 
The part of the, itch, the issue, however, is what's the specificity and sensitivity of either of these tests? Mm -hmm. And we probably don't have data on any of that. But that would really be, you know, if, certainly if you had a test that was 99% sensitive, <coughs> you'd be willing to wait a few hours if you got better data. I, I don't know how much I don't know how much I don't know how much contrast to use during the doing the actually the CT Milo. Uh, you actually might know, uh, but her headache actually got much better after it. Uh, which I feel like it's diagnostic in terms of symptomatology and imaging, maybe. Mm. Uh, do you know what is the uh, the recurrence, spontaneous recurrence, on a condition like this? Uh, I, sorry, I, I don't. Mm. Your recommendation of doing cervical and thoracic epidural blood patches was based on the data that there's more likely to be diverticular in that area? Um, or? So the, the one study, the Hanner study, actually, you know, there was, there, they had sort of negative imaging results. And they sort of, these patients had presented with postural headaches for four months with no sort of imaging studies to aid in the diagnosis. Um, and they sort of randomly assigned uh, you know, epidural blood patches at the two locations. I think they did it based on sort of the, the, the knowledge that most of the diverticular at the cervical, thoracic, and thoracolumbar lumbar junctions. But, but the N was eight? The N was 12, yeah. Okay. And do we know, I'm curious just about volumes. Because if you look at the literature, we, we're, we tend as anesthesiologists to feel very comfortable giving large volumes in, in the, the lumbar, lumbar area, sure. but not in the cervical, cervical. And, and thoracic. So yeah, so in that study, the lumbar was 20, and the thoracal lumbar, they still injected 15 mLs. This, is, this, this study was done in uh, the Netherlands. It's a small study. And, and they have, excuse me. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I just wanted to bring attention to a study that I had read after we had uh, encountered this case. And it was a study done in Italy. I think the N was uh, a little bit higher. I think the N was like in the 40s. <clears throat> I can't remember the name of the clinician that performed the study. Um, but the study was, you know, people that presented with this type of symptoms, low pressure headache. And uh, they injected, you know, five cc's of the fibrin glue into the lumbar space. And they couldn't identify any leakage <clears throat> per se with CT myelogram. But the other finding that was also consistent in all of the patients was on MRI was meningeal thickening. So that was like a sign that was associated with uh, low pressure headache. But anyways, so these 40 some patients, they all were injected with fibrin glue, I think five cc's or a little bit more. And they were all injected in the L1, L2 lumbar space and they, like the more, a majority of them got pretty good relief. So the, the hypothesis that they had in that paper was that since the epidural space is a negative pressure space and the subarachnoid space is adjacent to it, certain people with the higher negative pressure in the epidural space might not have a leak, but it, you know, it disrupts the balance and you have just this like spontaneous overflow of the uh, CSF into the epidural space. So they might not have like, an anatomical leak and it's just this disequilibrium phenomenon. So if you just put some volume into the epidural space, it doesn't matter where you put it because all of them were put in the L1, L2 space with like very good relief. So they were just saying they just kind of offset that imbalance by just putting in volume into the epidural space. That was like one of the hypotheses that was, I think so it was that Italian, I have the paper and I can forward it to you, can forward it to. All right, thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation, really very interesting. So why don't we move to the next case because we're getting close to the end of the session. All right, I'm uh, Scott Mayhew, one of the pain fellows at Beth Israel, and I'll be presenting a case of an 83-year-old female with intractable uh, neck pain, shoulder pain, and uh, as well as occipital pain and back pain. Uh, she was referred to Dr. Cruciani in July this year after many years of pain. Um, the most severe pain is in her neck, 
and she describes it as a heavy-duty ache, at times electrical. It radiates from the neck to the left occipital scalp and down both shoulders to the upper arms, most severely to the left side. Rarely it radiates to the hands, but not to any specific uh, fingers in particular, not in any identifiable radicular pattern. Uh, the pain is worse with neck extension and turning of the head, particularly to the left. It's less severe when she's asleep, but sometimes the uh, arm pain wakes her up. Uh, it's greatly affected her quality of life and her activities of daily living. When she walks, it's so severe her whole body shakes. Uh, there's no numbness, tingling, or weakness. The discomfort has uh, been unresponsive to a long series of treatments, uh, medical, interventional, and surgical, which I'll list. Uh, attempts at uh, surgical treatments are as follows. In 2003, she had her first low back surgery and had a second operation in 2007. In 2008, she had cervical and thoracic fusions with three subsequent operations to fix things as she describes them. At this point, she felt somewhat better but was not pain-free. In 2009, she developed osteomyelitis of T2 and T3, which led to vertebral body collapse with instability and also required six to eight weeks of antibiotics. Uh, ever since this point, both her neck head and thoracic pain, her neck pain in particular, have been much more severe. Um, she, she was tried on a long list of medications, which include baclofen, which caused problematic sedation, uh, Xanaflex, which uh, left her feeling overly sedated, nortriptyline, which was so long ago she can't remember anything about it, uh, Cymbalta, which she stopped due to vomiting, Opana, which didn't help, uh, lidocaine infusion, which provided no relief, also fentanyl patch, topical compounded morphine, Valium, <clears throat> tapipentadol, lidoderm patch, and Botox, none of which helped uh, enough to continue. Only Dilaudid helped, uh, which was stopped for unknown reasons, and uh, OxyContin also helped some at a total dose of 200 milligrams daily, uh, but not to uh, a large extent. Um, interventional treatments that have been tried are as follows. Uh, medial branch blocks, which gave her no relief. Epidural steroid injections, also no relief. Trigger points gave her a very brief relief at best. She had a pain pump put in at one point with Dilaudid and morphine, which gave her no significant relief um, and uh, actually caused her to vomit when the morphine was added. And she also had greater and lesser occipital nerve stimulator implant in 2010, which helped some initially but stopped helping and is now turned off. She also has tried acupuncture, chiropractic treatments, <clears throat> TENS units, physical therapy, and psychotherapy, none of which provided any relief. Um, this is all in addition to her current medical regimen, which includes methadone, 10 milligrams in the morning, 20 milligrams at noon, 20 milligrams uh, at night, along with oxycodone, uh, 30 um, Q4 hours as needed, trileptal, 150 BID, Celexa, 10 milligrams daily, Neurontin, 300 milligrams daily, and Furacet uh, occasionally is needed for migraines. Um, she also takes glucophage and allopurinol for her other past medical history, which includes <clears throat> diabetes, GERD, arthritis, mild depression, gout, hypertension, arthritis, and migraine headaches. As far as her social history goes, um, she doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, or take any street drugs. Family history is non-contributory. She's allergic to penicillin, sulfa, and morphine makes her vomit. Review systems is equally non-contributory. Um, for physical exam, um, uh, you know, I'll focus on pertinent abnormals. Um, she's not obese uh, at 5'5", five, five, uh, 145 pounds. Vitals are normal. HE, ENT, heart, lungs, abdomen, and pulses are all normal. On uh, neuro, uh, deep tendon reflexes are slightly brisk throughout. Um, the sensory exam is without any objective sensory deficits, but shows um, <clears throat> the subjective numbness and tingling in the left arm, which is intermittent. Uh, cranial nerves, motor, gait, Romberg, and the rest of the neuro exam is normal. The musculoskeletal exam shows uh, lots of spasm with palpation of the paraspinal muscles. There's decreased range of motion of the neck in all directions, particularly leftward rotation and leftward flexion. Um, right shoulder passive range of motion uh, triggers localized shoulder pain, but not the neck pain. And the back exam shows uh, midline surgical scar, uh, basically from the neck all the way to the thoracic and lumbar spine. 
Uh, relevant diagnostic studies are as follows. MRI of the brain showed uh, two right frontolateral convex meningiomas with mild underlying mass effect thought to be uh, incidental, unrelated. She also had small vessel ischemic change and diffuse volume loss uh, appropriate for age. CT of the surgical spine showed a possible loosening of the right C1 screw, uh, the opposite side of where the majority of her pain is. Also showed degenerative joint disease from C4 to C7 and post-surgical changes <clears throat> of her decompressive laminectomy from C4 to C6. Um, MRI of the C-spine from 2009 uh, concurred with the CT. Additionally, it showed no change in the central, um, foraminal, uh, central and foraminal stenosis noted on a prior study. Also, an upper extremity EMG showed findings consistent with sensory motor neuropathy. Um, so what's, what's her diagnosis? Somebody give me an answer, otherwise I have to pick on Adam. Let me ask Siri. Good, good, he is the new iPhone, excellent. Uh, well, she's clearly a very complicated case. Uh, I'm not sure what levels her uh, fusion were. Were they occipital to C1 or um, C1, C2? Um, C4 to C6, or well, that was the uh, decompressive laminectomy. Um, some of the, I don't know if, she's fused, I believe she said essentially f her whole spine is the way she described it. Yeah, pretty much her whole spine, I mean, which I, I, seemed hard to believe. But Without seeing it, I might guess that um, it could be an effect of the screw uh, on the nerve, uh, on the nerves, nerve roots coming out that side or degenerative change arthritis affecting the roots on that side. She clearly would have trouble with physical therapy, uh, not being able to exercise <clears throat> her neck and might have a lot of spastic pain. But, uh, okay, so um, um, as far as the, uh, are you going to go ahead? You wrote that she had spasm. Was it spasms or spasticity? Spasm. Do you have any upper motor neuron signs? Other than the slightly brisk reflexes, no. no. Well, so what is spasm exactly? Hmm? Muscle spasms. What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, I, you know, when you palpate her neck, she just kind of had a visible uh, tightening of the neck muscles. Her facial? Yeah, so as far, I mean, as far as the diagnosis, for lack of a more specific diagnosis, um, clearly you can call it post-cervical laminectomy cervicalgia. Also, um, occipital neuralgia seems very likely with the uh, pain radiating to the occipital, left occipital area. Also, an element of myofascial pain syndrome. Um, and what, what else is there left to try? I mean, she's had just about everything. Yes. Um, the question showed, is if there was an MRI of the brain? Yes, it showed two right frontolateral convex meningiomas with mild underlying mass effect. Uh, they are um, unchanged compared to yeah. prior studies three years ago. Yeah, unchanged. Did she have flexion extension views of her cervical spine? I don't believe so. Do you, do you remember? I, I don't think so. The question is flexion extension? No, I don't think so. Good. Good, good question. question yeah. of C, uh, loosening a screw at C1 on the opposite side, clearly you would worry she might be unstable. Right. Um, and, and that could cause, even if she was, the screw was loose on the other side, it could cause movement because it's a, a ring, and that could cause problems. I think that is a very good point. From a physical exam, the only motion that she can do is uh, <clears throat> limited to the left like this. She can go to the right all the way. She cannot flex and she cannot extend just can't because of the, the fusion is just uh, but but I, I liked your your thought so what, so they what are, should we do next can I add for the yeah. symptoms so uh, that might help people to understand a little bit so in terms of the presentation so she had two maybe three but but two clear uh, pain uh, pain syndromes there one one was the neuralgic type of pain that it became more uh, it, it really becomes more bothering to her and starts shooting 
when she moves the head to the left. And you can see her twitching every time she does that, you, f you feel it. And then she has a neuropathic type of pain that is burning and that is constant. And uh, it, 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 it kind of gets better when she's lying down, but it's there all the time. And it, it, it extends in the same distribution in the left side of the neck. It gets the left shoulder. And, uh, and it gets also the neck on the right side a little bit. And then uh, in addition to that, she has a migraines or, or headaches, I would say, that seem to be occipital first at the beginning, and then they, they extend to the entire head, but, but starts on this area on the left side of the temporal region. The, uh, the nerve stimulators are, and she has two leads, actually not one that goes across, but she has two vertical leads one on the lesser and the other one on the greater occipital nerves. So uh, one of the thinking there was if the, if the stimulator, either rather than helping, was doing some sort of a mechanical uh, irritation or stimulation of the nerve that would become more evident when you move the neck to the left side. I, I couldn't figure that one out yet that well. I, I sent up, up, we think, we thought about the possibility of just taking the stimulator off, uh, or at least one of the leads off, the one that seems to be doing uh, more, more, be more problematic. So what we did is we told the patient to stop the stimulator for a weekend, and uh, there was no much change. She had it on, on the time. It wasn't clear how much was helping. So the stimulator doesn't seem to be helping. Now the question is, if we go in and we remove the leads, are we going to help or cause more, more trouble by doing that? So everybody, we, everyone is really hesitant to uh, considering going back in there. So um, in addition to her current medical regimen, um, currently uh, she's undergoing a series of five treatments of transcranial direct current stimulation, um, otherwise known as TDCS. Um, I spoke to her after the second treatment. She said it was helping a little. She wasn't really sure. Um, she's probably done by now, isn't she? Yeah, uh, the okay. reason for the TDCS in this case was that uh, I think we tried a variety of uh, strategies with her, both pharmacological and interventional. Uh, from the pharmacological perspective is all the, that, the drugs that you mentioned pretty much, that they were uh, done properly in terms of the duration of the trial and the titration of the dose to side effects. And uh, always the, the, the pain relief that she experienced was, was really minimal with any of the medications. The only medication that I thought that was doing some difference was Trileptro. And it wasn't helping that much with the neuropathic burning pain that she has underlying, but rather with the neuralgic component of the pain. That was getting better. The problem is that I have to push the, the dose to, to a level that she started to have side effects. So and one of the side effects was hair loss, but it was coming like it was, it was, uh, it was very, very significant, and she, she didn't want uh, that. And so we, we cut down on the dose of the medication, and then uh, we tried other, other drugs that didn't help that much. So in that context, Dr. Slomba was involved also, and he did procedures. So what he did was uh, uh, we did some diagnostic testing. So we went for the occipital nerve, actually, and uh, the pain got better, uh, significantly better. Uh, we couldn't uh, actually isolate the, the, the generator really exactly or the level. Could be still C2 that was uh, uh, causing the pain, could be the occipital nerve itself. But the interesting thing is that it really got better. So after that, then he injected, I think, that the facet and he injected other areas to try to uh, clarify it better. And then eventually there was an attempt for radiofrequency and see if there was any improvement with that strategy. And uh, it, it, it didn't help that much. What it did help is that he injected also, at the time he did the procedure, some steroids, and that did give some, gave some relief. But it, everything has been uh, only uh, uh, temporary, and uh, that's why we kept doing other, uh, other techniques and strategies. So uh, some patients can benefit by doing brain stimulation. So that was the reason why we did it with her. And... Uh, uh, the patients that tend to do well for some reason that I still couldn't figure out that well is those with uh, trigemina neuralgia or facial pain, patients with posterior neuralgia, and patients with uh, Crips. So those tend to be, to be better compared, for example, with patients with uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy that they, none of the patients get better. So is, is that, I, I couldn't figure that one out. 
So she underwent this week uh, uh, a TDCS. Usually you see the benefit from this technique when it works during the first week. But uh, some patients, about 10, 20% of the patients, it take about another week after you finish the stimulation to experience some improvement. During the stimulation, she didn't find any improvement. She actually developed the, uh, the, the second, the third day, she started developing headaches, the ones that have that uh, occipital origin. And so we have to decrease from two milliampere to one milliampere the stimulation, which uh, the data shows that is not as good as two milliampere, but that's what we did. So, uh, so we will see. Uh, uh, during the procedure, it didn't help during the, the, the treatment. And I spoke with her today. She says that she felt somehow better. She's coming tomorrow uh, to see Slomba again, see what other interventions can be done. Yes. Uh, Uh, since she got so much relief from the uh, uh, occipital nerve blocks, do you think that there's more of a myofascial component than uh, a problem in the cervical spine? And if so, um, would you consider trying Botox again in a different, uh, you know, I don't know how it was given the first time. Anyone wants to comment on that? On Botox uh, for this patient? Any other issue I think that raises, I'm not, I don't want to address the Botox issue, is that we're going to get blocked the occipital nerve. Um, if you have a woman who you think may have undergone extensive surgery, may be unstable, maybe the problem isn't peripheral, it's central, and maybe you can do a transforaminal block or, or DRG RF at the level of C2. And maybe if you get more, more central, you can block fibers that you can't get out peripherally. Of course, the issue. I'm not a big fan of doing transfermal injections, except with just local anesthetic in the cervical spine. Um, and the issue, obviously, at C2 is it's where the vertebral artery crosses, so you really have to be careful. But you can get a you can get an RF probe into that area, um, and and maybe get central enough that you could eliminate problems if it's if it's uh, related to the cervical spine. Yeah, I, I wish Dr. Slomba was here because, you know, he has a better understanding of, the, of this and, and, and the procedures that he did. I remember the discussion about the DRGC2 uh, radio frequency. I can't remember if we did it finally or we moved into, into something else, but definitely it's something that is uh, under consideration. What do you say again? <laughs> yeah, but I don't, I don't remember exactly. But I remember the discussion. I listen when he talks. The only one. And uh, then the question about the Botox, right? So uh, how people feel about Botox for this patient. Um, we were a little hesitant from revisiting that because when she had it, my recollection, maybe it's not what you got from her, but my recollection is that for some reason the, the pain got worse. And, uh, and uh, then it's just one of these uh, situations where where nothing is helping that much and some things that normally don't go wrong go wrong. This is a patient that when I saw her first, she was in excruciating pain. And uh, she was in my office with uh, the two sons and one daughter-in-law and her husband. And uh, two of them are uh, they, they were members of the board here at BI. So it's just a typical thing. It's that those patients don't get better by definition. So uh, I admitted her for uh, uh, being more aggressive with the management of the pain. We did IVPCA uh, uh, opioids and see if uh, we could accelerate the titration. And she developed a hypertensive crisis. And uh, the hypertensive crisis went to, I don't know, something like 270 over 140. It was a nightmare. Eventually, we controlled it. And, and then she started doing well. That was a Friday night. Then Saturday that I was on call, I saw her. and. While I was there talking to her, the president of the hospital, the president of the board, the pre oh my God. So everybody <laughs> was, or it was, it was like a parade of VIPs. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just pretty amazing. These patients, by definition, don't do that well. <laughs> but the patients on Friday. Yeah, exactly. Friday also always, is, is, is another Friday. one. So uh, we are a little bit, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, the decisions on, on how to move forward because Every single uh, strategy that we tried uh, so far doesn't seem to be, uh, have, hasn't been definitely not the answer to the problem that we have now.
is one of the reasons why I wanted to present it because I think that makes it more interesting and maybe you guys can come up with some suggestions actually. What are you saying? Yeah, yeah, but you know, we, we the reason for the admission was a lidocaine infusion. And right when we were starting the lidocaine, I don't think that she got that much, is when she made that hypertrans uh, hypertensive crisis. So I'm a little hesitant to do anything uh, with this lady that is, uh, it can be considered aggressive. Although, you know, it, I mean, I agree, it might work. All right. Any other questions? It's 8.05, so. Uh, Maybe we can close the, the session. Michael, again, thank you very much. I think that this is terrific. And thank you for...